Well, good morning. If you want to turn your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 9. 1 Samuel chapter 9 is where we'll begin. I have a few more comments to say before the worship lesson, but I just want to express my deep gratitude and appreciation for uh, the opportunity to be with you this week. It is an honor, it's a privilege to be able to have the opportunity to stand before you and present a lesson, lessons from God's Word. As Tyler alluded to, our text this morning and our base text for the entirety of the week will be 1 Samuel chapter 17. So once we get to that text, I invite you to put a bookmark or a ribbon there. We're going to come back to that text each and every lesson for this week. But I want us to begin there in 1 Samuel chapter 9. But before we do so, let me begin with a story. In 1952, a woman named Florence Chadwick attempted to swim from Catalina Island to the California coast span of 26 miles in an attempt to set a record for covering that distance. <laughs> Roughly 15 hours into her swim, a heavy fog settled itself on the path before her. Blinded by fog, she became disoriented and discouraged and gave up. When she finally decided she couldn't go on, her escorts in a boat helped her out of the water. The escorts feared to tell her the truth. Florence was about a mile from her goal. Her only reply after learning how close she actually came was, all I could see was hopeless. Now there's a happy ending to the story. Her clouded vision had kept her from victory, but two months later, she tried to swim the same channel. The thick fog set in, and she succeeded. She made the swim an additional two times, also became the first woman to swim the English Channel in both directions. She conquered her giant. She faced her challenge head on and defeated that giant. And I want to ask the question this morning, how do you see your challenges? How do I see my challenges? How do you see your challenges? Because I would suggest we could look at our challenges through the eyes of the faithless or through the eyes of the faithful. In any situation, what you are determines what you see. What you see determines what you do. The story of David and Goliath, one of the most epic stories in the entirety of the Bible, and I am confident that I could go back to any one of those classrooms back there and ask any one of the children, tell me about the story of David and Goliath, and they would be able to recap that story for us. It's one of the most well-known stories within the Bible. Can you imagine what would have happened if David didn't trust God when he went to fight Goliath? David believed that he could defeat Goliath, successfully defeat him, because he had the ultimate faith in God. He was confident he would be the victor. Your Goliath isn't some giant physical specimen standing in front of you, but your giant today, this morning, could be addiction. It could be marital problems. It could be financial strain. It could be a habit, an attitude, an illness. We can't avoid that Goliath. And I would suggest to you this morning that facing that Goliath head on is necessary for our growth as a Christian. So I hope to some degree that this series this week will be of some benefit. We're going to look at anger later on this morning, this evening, worry, how we can defeat worry. And then greed, Monday night, Tuesday night, rejection, and fear on Wednesday night. Let's go ahead and dive into the story of David and Goliath. Who was Goliath? Well, to get the, the set the scene for this story, we need to backtrack a little bit. In Judges chapter 21 and verse 25, in those days, no, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. This is a very critical moment in the history of Israel. They did whatever they wanted. There was no king. But if you move forward to 1 Samuel chapter 8, what were they desiring at that point in history? They wanted a king. They wanted to be just like everyone else. But God warned them. He tells them that this king is going to take advantage of you. He's going to make it hard on you. He's going to make it extremely difficult on you. But did they listen? They did not. God tells Samuel, give them, give them what they want. They want a king. 
That's where we're at in 1 Samuel chapter 9. Let's begin there in verse 1. 1 Samuel chapter 9 and verse 1. There was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish, the son of Abiel, the son of Zerah, the son of Bechorath, the son of Aphia, a Benjamite, a mighty man of power. And he had a choice and handsome son whose name was Saul. There was not a more handsome person than he among the children of Israel. From his shoulders upward, he was taller than any of the people. The way that Saul is described here, he looks the part as a king. <laughs> He's the guy. If you had a draft board, he'd be the number one pick. He's the guy. You can't go wrong with Saul. But as we know with the story of Saul, he becomes disobedient. His kingship is stripped from, there, stripped from him there in 1 Samuel chapter 15 because he did not obey. And then we get to chapter 16, 1 Samuel chapter 16. Saul looks like a king. He looks like the part. But does David? This is the story of David being anointed the next king. And Solomon arrives at the house of Jesse. And so it was in verse 6 when they came that he looked at Eliab. This is Samuel looking at Eliab. And said, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. He's the oldest of Jesse's sons. Surely he's the guy. The Lord said to Samuel in verse 7, Do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For a man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel there in verse 8. Neither has the Lord chosen this one. And then on and on the seven of his sons passed before Samuel. And the Lord has not chosen any of these there in verse 10. Well, where's David? Well, David wasn't even there. And Samuel said to Jesse, send him, bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. In verse 12, so he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy with bright eyes and good looking. And the Lord said, arise, anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil, anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel arose and went to Ramah. We see here David being anointed the very next king. A young shepherd boy. So that's a little bit of background about David and where Israel is at and its history. Let's go ahead and jump to the text there in 1 Samuel 17 and begin there in verse 1. 1 Samuel chapter 17, beginning in verse 1. Now the Philistines gathered their armies together to battle and were gathered at Soko, which belongs to Judah. They encamped between Soko and Azekah and Ephnis Damon. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together, and they encamped in the valley of Elah and drew up in battle array against the Philistines. The Philistines stood on a mountain on one side, and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side with a valley between them. And a champion went out from the camp of the Philistines named Goliath from Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. He had a bronze helmet on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. And he had bronze armor on his legs and a bronze javelin between his shoulders. Now the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his iron spearhead weighed 600 shekels, and a shield bearer went before him. Let's go ahead and stop there. You can picture this scene in your mind. You've got the Israelites on one side, on one mountain. There's Philistines on the other mountain. There's a valley between them. And, and they're sizing each other up. And the scriptures describe Goliath as the champion. And in the Hebrew, the champion means a man who is a go-between. Meaning that he is the one chosen to represent the Philistines as a stand-in for the entirety of the army. It's a one-on-one -on -one battle. And of course, his opponent had to be as strong and mighty as he was to make it a fight, to make it a battle. So Goliath offers a challenge. Send one of your best warriors to fight me. Winner take all. But did you notice how Goliath is described here? Notice his size. Over nine feet tall. Some versions render this nine feet nine inches. It's a big man. Over nine feet tall. 125 to 150 pounds of armor. His spear weighed 15 to 17 pounds. His shield was carried by a Philistine. That detail is given to us in verse 41 of 1 
1 Samuel 17. He was a war machine, a killing machine who struck terror in the heart of his opponents. Let's pick up there again in verse 8. Then he stood and cried out to the armies of Israel and said to them, Why have you come out to line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine and you the servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we might fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. There he is, standing before the Israelites, taunting them. Scriptures tell us that they were greatly afraid. And this goes on for 40 days, morning and evening. Verse 16, the Philistines drew near and presented themselves 40 days, morning and evening. If you're able to kill me, we will be your servants. If I kill you, you will be our servants. That was the deal. That was the offer. There weren't any takers. Verse 13. Let's jump back up to verse 13. Notice who is there. The three oldest sons of Jesse had gone to follow Saul to the battle. The names of the three sons who went to the battle were Eliab, the firstborn, next to him Abinadab, and the third Shammah. But where is David? Well, David's back at the house, and he's taking care of the sheep, being a young shepherd boy. But notice the request that his father makes to him in verse 23. In verse 23. Verse 23, he hears the words of Goliath after his father Jesse has him take food and gets uh, to get a report from them and send back to his household. But in verse 23, while he's in the presence of his brothers and the presence of the warriors and the Goliath, it says he spoke according to the same words, so David heard him. So now David hears the words of Goliath, intimidating them and threatening them. David speaks in verse 26. What shall be done for the man who kills the Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And we see that David's oldest brother gets angry with him. In verse 28, heard when he spoke to the men, Eliab's anger was aroused against David and said, Why did you come down here? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your pride and the insolence of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. Well, eventually Saul catches wind of David. David's there. He knows what's going on. Look at with me in verse 32. David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. Saul said to David, you are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are a youth and a man, he a man of war from his youth. David, you're crazy. There's no way that you can stand a chance against Goliath. You are just a young shepherd boy. He has been raised to be a warrior since his youth. But David responds that the Lord has delivered him from the hand of lions and bears, and the Lord will deliver him in this situation as well. Well, we know what Goliath is wearing. Notice what Saul tries to do in verse 38. He clothed David with his armor, and he put a bronze helmet on his head. He also clothed him with a coat of mail. Saul attempts to equip David with Saul's equipment, with his armor. Well, it should have been Saul going out there on battle. He tries to put David, a young shepherd boy, into his own armor. And we already know that Saul is a tall man, a big man. In verse 39, David fastened his sword to his armor and tried to walk, for he had not tested them. And David said to Saul, I can't walk with these, for I have not tested them. So David took them off. So what does David choose to do? Verse 40, he took his staff in his hand, and he chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag and a pouch which he had, and his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. He grabs his weapons, a staff, a sling, five smooth stones. Now, on paper, this is a mismatch on every level. There's no way that David 
can defeat Goliath. But he steps out. Goliath comes down from the hill. But when Goliath sees David, he's in disbelief. He can't believe it. So the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and to the beast of the field. He insults David. But David does not back down. He doesn't cower in fear. He does not retreat. Verse 45. Then David said to Philistine, You come to me with a sword, with a spear, and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Then all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. Hey, you may have the physical components to fight this battle, but I have God. That's all I need. So what happens? Verse 48, so it was when the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, that David hurried and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. Then David put his hand in his bag and took out a stone, and he slung it and struck the Philistine in his forehead, so that the stone sank into his forehead, and he fell on his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone, but struck the Philistine and killed him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore David ran and stood over the Philistine, took his sword, and drew it out of its sheath and killed him. He cut off his head with it. And when the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. What a monumental upset. David versus Goliath. You probably have heard that phrase. If you're a sports fan. Upsets. That's where it comes from. A monumental upset. What helped David? What led David? Well, David saw what God saw. Why did the, the Israelites shake in fear of Goliath? Because they saw what man saw. They saw a giant who had been trained in battle since his youth. But David did not look at the size of the obstacle, but at the power of his God. You know, all of us face challenges that when we look at those challenges head on, they appear to be insurmountable. You can't defeat them. You can't overcome them. All of us have those types of challenges. But what set David apart? What made David different? Let's look at three points this morning, and the lesson will be yours. The first one is this. David listened to God. David listened to God. How much better would we be if we didn't worry about what other people think or said? There are people in our lives who are going to tell us we're not good enough. There are going to be people in our lives who tell us that you're not capable, you're not able to. Satan will whisper doubts in our ears. We'll talk more about that Tuesday night on the lesson on rejection. But David ignored those doubters. David ignored those critics. Let's go back in verse 28. In verse 28. Now Eliab, his oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men, Eliab's anger was aroused against David. And he said, why did you come down here? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the, in the wilderness? I know your pride, and I know your insolence of your heart, and you have come down to see the battle. David said, what have I done now? Is there not a cause? Then he turned from him toward another and said the same thing, and these people answered him as the first ones did. Eliab was upset. He didn't build up the courage to go and step on the battlefield against Goliath. He couldn't do that, nor could anyone else, his brothers or the other soldiers in the army of Israel. They were not willing to stand up to Goliath, and it infuriated him. In verse 33, in verse 33, it continues. You are not able, this is Saul speaking to David, you are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him. For you are a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. He began to tell David, these are all the reasons you can't go up against Goliath. So you've 
got his brothers. You've got Saul. You can't slay Goliath. But did David listen to them? He listened to God. In Psalm 85 and verse 8, I will hear what God the Lord will speak. For he will speak peace to his people and to his saints. But let them not turn back to folly. David didn't listen to the voices that told him that he was not qualified. He didn't listen to those naysayers. He didn't listen to to those who told him he was inexperienced, that he couldn't do it. But David knew in his heart that he was capable. And why did he believe that he was capable? I would suggest to you one reason is that he looked to the past. He looked to the past. David volunteers to fight Goliath. Notice with me verses 34 through 37. We didn't read this text, and let's go ahead and read this portion of the story. Verse Samuel 17, 34 through 37. But David said to Saul, Your servant used to keep his father's sheep. And when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went out from it and went out after it and struck it, and delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it arose against me, I caught it by its beard and struck and killed it. Your servant has killed both lion and bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. Moreover, David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of the Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. Saul pulls David aside, tells him that you're not able to go up against Goliath. But what did David rely upon? David relied upon his past successes, knowing it was only through the hand of God that he was victorious and that he was confident he would be victorious in this battle as well. He will later on write in Psalm 9 and verse 10, And those who know your name will put their trust in you. For you, Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. How intense did David seek God? Well, he's described in Acts chapter 13 and verse 22 as a man after God's own heart. That's who David was. That was his character. We could take a page out of David's book. Too often we forget to think about how God has gotten us through our previous trials. He's gotten us this far. God will deliver us again. What giants has God delivered you from? He's carried you through difficult times up until this moment. We must have the faith and confidence that he will carry us through and deliver us through moving forward. God is a faithful God. I want to encourage us to think about the past battles that we've won with God on our side. We can't look at how far we have to go. But look how far we've come. God has always come through in the clutch. He delivered David in the battle against Goliath, and he will deliver us from our giants as well. The third and final point this morning is David was prepared. David was prepared. You read the interaction between Saul and David in verses 38 and 39. I can't help but chuckle. He's thinking like a warrior, and he's trying to put that equipment upon David, forcing it upon David. But David says, I I can't walk in this. I haven't tested this. But David prepares to face him as a shepherd. What he knows, what he's experienced with, So what does he do? He takes his staff, a slingshot, five smooth stones he gathered from the brook. What's so impressive with David here in the story is that he did not need to be Goliath. He didn't need to be like Goliath. He didn't need to be like Saul. He didn't need to be like his brothers. He just had to be David. He just had to be David. He needed to do what he could do. God wants his children to be who they are and do what God has made them to do. Each one of you in this room has been blessed with abilities and talents. And those abilities and talents have been given to you by God. You've been blessed with those things by God. What does God expect out of you? To utilize those talents and abilities. Not be someone else, but be you. Be you who God has created. 
David chose five smooth stones in verse 40. He knew what would work for him. David played to his strengths. In verse 41, so the Philistine came and began drawing near to David, and the man who bore the shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him, for he was only a youth, ruddy and good looking. We read verses 43 and 44. David said, you come to me in verse 45 with a sword, a spear, and a javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. He had courage, and that courage was fueled by God. David knew that he would win because God was on his side. David defeats Goliath, read verses 48 through 51. Notice with me in verse 54. David took the head, which he cut off there in verse 51, and brought it to Jerusalem, and he put his armor in his tent. That's such an intense scene. Cutting off the head of Goliath, taking that head, and bringing it to Jerusalem. What David acknowledged and realized in this story, as he depended on the power of God, David still had to do his part. He still had to do his part in preparing. David still had to do his part in going out onto the battlefield. And God always wants us to do our part. He said, God comes through in the clutch for us all the time. But it also means that we've got to do our part as well. With the gifts and the abilities that he has given to us. There's a story about a country preacher who was making his way through the woods to church. He came upon a bridge over a small river. Halfway across the bridge, a bear appeared at the other end. Immediately, the preacher dove into the river, floated downstream, and got back on course for church. When he arrived, he was still soaked. After he related his story to everyone, a little boy asked him, Preacher, didn't you pray when you saw that bear? The preacher replied, Son, prayer is fine for a prayer meeting. You don't do a whole lot of good at a bear meeting. There comes a time when prayer has to be acted upon. Where we believe, and we prayed, we remember the times when God has been there for us, now it's up to us. Now it's up to us to act where our Goliath must be confronted. You know, had David said all of those things to Saul and to the Israelite warriors and even to Goliath, about all those things about courage and faith, then turned around and went back home without acting on the conviction, he would be as big a coward as the men who fled at the sight of Goliath. David boldly faced his Goliath head on. And we can too. No matter how much we pray, there comes a time to stop praying and act. Where we load up that slingshot, do what needs to be done, and say what needs to be said. What's so impressive with David is that he did not run away from the challenge. He did not try to run away from the challenge. Didn't, David didn't say, well, this is someone else's problem. Saul, this is on you. Eliab, this is on you. He took five smooth stones. I would suggest to you that he took five smooth stones for a particular reason. That if he missed on the first shot, he was going to take another shot. If he missed on the second shot, he was going to take another shot at Goliath. David was not about to turn and run away. He was about not to, to give up. He took his stand, and he was going to sling his stones until he hit Goliath. He was persevering. He was ready to persevere. We're reminded of what Paul says, looking at a New Testament passage in Romans chapter 5, verses 3 and 4. But not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character. Recognize we all have giants. We all face hardships. And seemingly they seem insurmountable. Obstacles that can never be conquered. 
We all have temptations. So what are your giants? What is it that you live in fear of? What is it that we allow to dictate how we live, act, and feel? I hope that this series is of be some benefit to you because it really hits home with me, the challenges that I face on a day-to-day -day basis, that our family faces on a day-to-day -day basis, and I hope that it hits home with you as well. It could be fear. It could be worry. It could be rejection. It could be greed. It could be patience or comfort, anger. Realize the battle belongs to the Lord. In verse 47 again, one final time, that all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our the battle belongs to the Lord. In any battle, it's important to know who's got your back. Any battle, it's important to know, well, who's in the foxhole with me? And in this spiritual war, it's God. And in Romans chapter 8, verse 31, Paul says, If God is for us, who can be against us? Psalm 118, verse 6, the Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? As we close our time together this morning, I appreciate so much your kind attention, and I encourage you to uh, place a bookmark there in 1 Samuel chapter 17 as we'll use that as a launching point for each and every lesson this week. But you put David's stats and, and his size on paper versus Goliath, he didn't stand a chance. The odds were stacked against him. But as we know, battles aren't played on paper. And David had the courage, the strength, the faith, all based on his relationship with God to defeat Goliath. He won confident we can as well thank you again so much for your kind attention look forward to our time together this week and if you have any questions or thoughts as the week proceeds we're more than happy to talk scripture with you thank you so much